amazing teaching throughout Galilee would have been preceded. Uh, that news would have been known by everybody in Nazareth, uh, especially for Jesus uh, being from Nazareth. They would have heard. All that news had gone far and wide, and it certainly reached his hometown, you would think. And so as we close this chapter, we're going to look at a couple of things. I'd like to look at Jesus' return home. And uh, secondly, then we're going to go ahead and look at how familiarity can breed contempt. And then finally, we want to take a look at how offended hearts affect the way God blesses. Offended hearts can have an effect on the way God blesses. So let's just open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll take a look at the Scripture. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, uh, just off of Thanksgiving and off a set of music that just uh, turned our hearts to you to give you thanks, we are grateful for your word. We're thankful that we have these stories that recount your son's time on earth and that we can see the way that he interacted with various situations and individual people. And Father, we can take away from them principles that can be applied to our own lives even right now today. We pray, Father, that you'd open the hearts of our understanding, that you'd open our minds, that we would be not distracted by whatever, but that we would focus on what you have for us today through the preaching of your word. Let us hear your spirit speak to us today, we pray, through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So, just look at the verses we're going to look at in verse, beginning in verse 53 of chapter 13. When Jesus had finished these parables, the ones that we have been going through these last many weeks, he departed from there, and he came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished, and they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Well, homecomings are the stuff of novels. And if you read very much, you've seen many that have been written with the much-anticipated homecoming. And the reality of things never anticipate it when the actual homecoming is played out. There's great anticipation of going home again, and when you get there, it's often a disappointment. It's at least different than what you anticipated it to be. To anyone who has read and enjoyed the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you'll remember that after Frodo Baggins had destroyed the ring of power, he returned to his home in the Shire. He was merely echoing his predecessor's sentiment caught in a poem entitled Bilbo's End of Journey Song. You remember Bilbo was the hobbit that went on the first journey and Frodo was the second journey. He wrote this about his, the journey's end. The road goes ever on and on out from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone let others follow it who can. Let them journey new begin, but I at last, with weary feet, will turn towards the lighted inn, meaning home. Turn towards the lighted inn, my evening rest and sleep to meet. He was done, and he was ready to go home. And so Frodo, in the same way, after his long and difficult journey, entered the region of his longed-for shire, and they reminisced about the Shire during the years of their journey. And as he did so, he experienced a faint sense of discomfort because as they entered the Shire, he understood the Shire was not quite the same as he had anticipated it to be. And it wasn't too much missed upon him that he wasn't the same as the hobbit that had left long ago coming back to the Shire. There and back again is a literary motif that's 
been rehearsed countlessly throughout the centuries and long before Tolkien's book. The Iliad is the narrative that describes a king who leaves his home to wage war of which he did not win to come back to a queen who was faithless and unloving to him. And so he's moved to horrible revenge instead of that great homecoming that he had anticipated. The Iliad, or the Iliad is just one example. The Odyssey is another one. Odysseus returns home only to discover everything's under siege. And so he's moved to horrible revenge as well. Disappointed homecomings, huh? Returning home is not always what a person returning might have thought it would be. Yet there is in the soul of every human being this elusive sense of going home. We think in our minds that to return home is to return to a place where there's safety and, and comfort and love and warmth. We imagine that we all once had that. Did we? <laughs> That's the first question. Were our homes actually like that? Or have we blotted out the troubles and the difficulties and the stresses? And somehow there's this elusive sense of well-being that we think we're equating with home when really it's something much else. You see, God has placed something in everybody's heart, and it's called eternity. And that pulls on us. It tugs and it tears us toward it, unlike any other force that we've known. Ever elusive, yet it's, it's, it's distinct, but faint. It's something that we long for, and sometimes we acquaint it with home. I know because I went away for a long time, and I came home, and it was nothing like I had imagined. Have you ever had the opportunity to go back to the home that you grew up in? Many, many years later, I went back and visited the house that I grew up in, uh, after other people had lived there and everything. And, and the thing that struck me is it was way smaller than I remember it being. And it wasn't near as grand as I had made it up in my mind. It was just a house. It was a small little house. And, you know, it wasn't like I had anticipated. Someday, those of us who believe will be swallowed up in the reality of heaven. And that that sense of being home will finally be experienced in fullness, and that's what we look for. Well, today we want to talk about Jesus' return to his hometown because that's exactly what the text talks about. Now, I said to you that this is his second return to Nazareth, and a year prior to this he returned to Nazareth. And if you want to make a note, you can, you can put it in your Bible. It's covered in Luke 4 verses 16 through 21. That was the first time they went back home. And he had an interesting experience when he did that the first time. He went into the synagogue, which he grew up in. And uh, being someone from outside, coming back, he had the opportunity to speak to them. He spoke to them from Isaiah 61. Actually, what he did was he identified himself as Messiah. And he said, today, this scripture that I've read to you has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm here. Messiah is here. I am Messiah. His relatives and friends and neighbors marveled at his teaching, but they were unbelieving. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Really similar to today. And the text that we have before us in the second coming. And Jesus assumed that they all wanted him to do the type of miracles that he had done in Capernaum. But he rebuked them, saying, no prophets welcome in his hometown. And then he gave them a short story, a little history lesson from the Old Testament. He talked about Elijah being sent to the widow at Zarephath, who was a Gentile. And then he also talked about Naaman, the Syrian, also a Gentile, who was healed. And when he did that, Quoting those two stories, Jesus was telling them clearly that in the case of the widow, the only one who received blessing from the prophet was a Gentile person. And the only one that was healed was a Gentile, Naaman. And so it's a dangerous thing to reject a prophet. That's what he was saying because he had told them, you're not, you're not receiving a prophet who's come into your midst. 
Jesus' whole point was that if the Jews, represented by his hometown people, persisted and rejected him, his use of the proverb, uh, proverb that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown, if they consistently rejected him, God would send him, Messiah, to the Gentiles. They all got his message loud and clear. Even though we have to read in between the lines and do a lot of Bible background studying to understand what they heard him saying when he quoted from Isaiah 61 and said, it's been fulfilled, I'm Messiah. And then when he quoted the Old Testament about Elijah and Naaman, they understood what he said because we realize that their response to him was that they were filled with rage and they grabbed him and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill of which their city was built on and they were going to throw him off a cliff. But it wasn't Jesus' time yet at that time when we read Jesus passing through their midst. He went on his way. Well, that was his first homecoming. That was his first homecoming. Second homecoming we see in the first couple verses here he came to his hometown, verse 54, and began teaching them in their synagogue. He went to the synagogue again. You see, everything was wrapped up in church for the Jews. And that's the way it should be for us, too. Church is our life. It should be our life. Listen, look around you. And there may be some unbelievers amongst us, some that are looking and trying to understand and put things together. Might even be some who just don't even care, but they've been dragged here by somebody. I don't know. But for the most part, most of you guys have put your faith in Jesus Christ. Look around you. You're going to be with these people for the rest of eternity. Okay? They are really your brothers and sisters. You have one Father, and He is God, and He is in heaven. And because of Jesus Christ's work in your life, you're going to spend all eternity with one another. I suggest we learn how to get along with each other and begin to enjoy one another a little bit more maybe than we do. But the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus went back, he went into the synagogue, which the whole life of the people at Nazareth was centered around, and he taught them. And once again, they were amazed at his teaching. Do you think it's possible, this is just a question for you to ponder in your own mind, do you think it's possible to be kind of captivated by Jesus and still reject him? Do you think it's possible to think Jesus is a very interesting personality and yet reject him as God? Very possible. The people of his hometown listen to him, teach. And the Bible says that they were astonished. They were astonished. Ekpleso. Ekpleso. It means to be uh, something that strikes out, or, or maybe a better term would be, it, it, to be something to be expelled by a blow. I like to think of it, it took their breath away. When he preached, it took their breath away. They were astounded at his preaching. It was like they were knocked out by his preaching. And whatever the word means, actually, it surely means that the people didn't listen to him listlessly. They weren't drowsy as he spoke and as he preached. His teaching had a serious effect on them, and they marked it. They were astounded by the things that he said in his teaching. And the reason is, is because his teaching was the truth. In John 18, 37, we read, Jesus talking to Pilate, and he says this, For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth, to preach the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Because Jesus himself is the way. He is the truth embodied, and he is the life. And nobody comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. So his teaching was the truth. That's one reason it grabbed their hearts and astounded them. Secondly, his teaching was about serious matters. The religious teachers of the day were all caught up in a a bunch of minutia that made no sense whatsoever, couldn't relate to life. 
He says in Matthew 23, 23 of the religious leaders, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier things of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. They didn't talk a lot about really serious matters. They talked about how much cumin you should take out of the cumin that you have and how much dill and so forth. Trivial things, things that mattered not a whit to anybody. And they were boring. Jesus wasn't boring in his teaching. Thirdly, his teaching was as one who loved them. They could sense that. People could sense that in Christ's teaching. He guided them into truth for salvation of their eternal souls. He was always encouraging them with the kingdom of heaven, which was to come, and warning them about hell and eternal punishment in separation from God. And he did that because he loved them and he wanted them to experience the eternal presence of God in heaven. And that came through. And finally, his teaching was always with authority. And this may be the single most important element that took their breath away from them. His teaching was made up of the very heart and mind of the Father, of God himself. They were the words of God. The things which I heard from him, Jesus said, These I speak to the world. These words I speak to the world. I've heard from the Father, and I'm telling you what he has said. Tragically, even though Jesus' teaching astonished them, they still rejected him. They still didn't believe in him. Reminds me of a lot of people in churches today. I don't know why they come to church. I don't know why they keep coming to church. They don't really believe that Jesus is God. They really question whether there is actually a hell because they see God as being a very loving God and God would never send anybody to hell, which is not biblical at all (laughs) because the scriptures teach just the opposite. But they come and they're enamored with the things of God, but they have no knowledge of God personally in their life. Well, we see in this text that we've read this morning that familiarity breeds contempt. Verses 55 and 56 are very clear. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man, Jesus, get these things? His own people knew his family well. We're not talking about New York City here. We're talking Nazareth. This is small, a small town. And they all knew him too. They knew who Jesus was in the flesh. But their unbelieving hearts, though astonished at his teaching, would not allow them to see him as anything more than a man. Now there's a distinct disadvantage when approaching God to consider him as you do yourself. Listen to me. It's not infrequent as you might think. It's a curse that we all suffer called subjectivity. We view things through our perspective, and some of us view God through our perspective instead of through the lens of his self-revelation, the Bible. That's why we have this, is to reveal to us who God is and what God demands. You see, in Psalm 50, verse 21, after God lists a whole bunch of sins that these people were doing, he says this in verse 21, These things you have done, and I kept silent, because you thought I was just like you. That's a huge rebuke. You thought I, God, the God of the universe, was just like you. The same as they were in that they didn't judge sin. The same in that they would not punish sin. The same in that they thought he was just human like them, filled with trouble and error even as they were. That was their perception of God, a very weak view of God. Maybe today it would be 
God is a God of love. He would never send anybody to hell. Well, that's your own reasoning. That's you thinking those thoughts. You will not find that in the Bible. And other things that we think about God. The book of Romans judges sinful people in that even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. That's a frightening statement. It, it, it tells us that there are people in the world that know that there is a God, they know there is a God, and yet they do not honor him or receive him as God. So how do they receive him? Well, they receive him in their own making. They've made God something of their own mind that doesn't match up to the Scripture, and so therefore they don't honor him as he is indeed God and as he has revealed himself in the Bible. God is other. I put parentheses there. God is other. He's beyond us. He cannot be understood through human subjectivity, but only by the objective outside of ourselves, the objective self-revelation that he's given us in the Bible. That's why we look at the Bible. And the Bible then is to take our subjective views of God, our perceptions of him that are wrong, and they are to be corrected with what the Word of God tells us about God. That's why we study the Bible. Now, Jesus' own people from the very town in which he grew up were unable to see Jesus as anything different from themselves. They used a number of reasons to justify their willful disbelief. Number one, he had not received any further education than they had. He didn't go away to university. He left them, and when he began his public ministry, he got baptized, and then he, he came back to them. And it's at that time, that first visit, that they say, who is this? Isn't this Joseph, the carpenter's son? And now he's coming back a year after that. And they still, he, he hadn't been educated beyond them. He was just Joseph's son. Secondly, he was not some amazing human being coming to Nazareth from outside of the area. They knew who he was. He was one of the family. He was of Joseph and Mary. He had a father, and they all knew him, Joseph. And he had a mother, Mary. He had brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And he had sisters. And they all knew who his family was. And he was part of that family. And so who is he thinking he is? They forgot pretty quickly how astounded they were when they listened to him speak. But they knew quite well that he was making some claims. And they were having none of it. Mary was his mother. And they all knew Mary to be his mother. You can see that in John 2, 1 and Acts 1, 14. Mary is never anywhere in the Bible referred to as the mother of God. The mother of Jesus, yes, never the mother of God. That's a designation that's part of Roman Catholic theology, but it has no biblical warrant. Just as Christ's human nature had no father, listen to me, Christ's human nature had no father. His divine nature had no mother. <laughs> okay? He's other. He's unlike anyone. He's God. And as to his brothers and sisters, there are three views on his brothers and sisters. Are you aware of those? If you have a different religious background, maybe you're coming to us from different perspectives, I just want to tell you that there's three different views. One is that they were actually Jesus' siblings. They were all the children of Mary and Joseph after Jesus was born, and so they were younger. Now, I know we don't hear much about Joseph afterwards, and some would say that he died, but maybe not before he had other children, both sons and daughters. We don't have a lot of information on that. But that's one view, that they are actually brothers and sisters of Jesus. Second view is that they were his step-siblings. Now, this is a view that's promoted 
and I'll get to this in a little bit, that these are children of Joseph by a previous marriage because Joseph was an older man when he took Mary as his wife, and therefore all these children would be older than Jesus, and Jesus would be the son of Mary and Joseph together, and there you go. That's that one, step-siblings. Third one is that they were cousins on his mother's side, all or all on Joseph's sides, but they weren't really his, his, his actual brothers and sisters. Do you know why this teaching is about? Think about it. The main reason that this is there is because what's motivating it is the Immaculate Conception. What's motivating it is the perpetual virginity of Mary, mother of God. There's not any textual basis for it. In the first view, which is the most natural way to just take the text at face value, and in Matthew 125, it says, Joseph kept Mary a virgin till she gave birth. It implies that afterwards... They had relations. In Luke 2, 7, we read she gave birth to her firstborn, which would intimate that he's the firstborn of others. But we don't have a lot more information on that. The second, I, I take that first view, in case you haven't figured it out, I take the first view. It's their brothers and sisters, okay? That's what I understand it to be. The second view Family behavior at the time of Jesus would never allow younger siblings to chide Jesus the way his brothers and sisters possibly did. Look at John 7, 3. And you remember the time that they came and visited him at Capernaum, him and his mother, and asked for an audience with him. And they said, because he's beside himself. Beside himself. That sounds to me like real brothers and sisters. You know, It's like they're going to help the brother out. They wouldn't do that if they were if they were younger. Okay? And 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 stepchildren. And the third view, it's too weak an argument based on unfounded linguistic arguments from the Septuagint. And you say, "Oh my gosh, what are we doing here again, the Septuagint?" Well, you got to understand this stuff. I believe it's best just to take the scripture at its word that these were indeed his brothers and sisters. Sisters aren't even named. If these so-called children were from an earlier marriage of Joseph, can I just ask you a question? What happened to them when Joseph and Mary and Jesus fled to Egypt? Just a thought. Now, most of the confusion arises from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. You understand this, right? There, on occasion, the Greek word adelphos, adelphos is the Greek word for brother, is used to represent close relationships like cousins. The Hebrew word is ach, ach. And ach is translated in the Greek, in the Septuagint, as adelphus. Okay? The Greek word for cousin is ach. But there is no linguistic justification to support the notion that Adelphus then should therefore refer to cousins of Jesus. Just because it's used, and I think in a wrong way, to identify cousins in the Old Testament, it's a Greek translation of the Hebrew, and uses Adelphus, which means brother in the Greek, there's no reason to say, well, that means that in the New Testament then, where it's used of Jesus' brothers and sisters, it's meaning cousins. There's no you can't do that with scripture. You can't do that with linguistics. James is referred to as the Lord's brother by Paul in Galatians 1.18. And the same James is an assumed leader of the church at Jerusalem and is also called there James, the brother of Jesus. As I said, the reason behind pushing for them to be cousins or something other than siblings is to protect the immaculate conception of Mary, and the perpetual virginity of Mary, which are both doctrines that are extrapolated and added to Scripture, not coming out from Scripture. 
Okay, that's your theological study for today. Back to our message, okay? When familiarity blinds the mind. The Bible does show a number of instances where siblings did not show honor to one another, does it not? You have that with Cain and Abel. You have that with Esau toward Jacob. How about Aaron and Miriam toward Moses? In Numbers 12, they took issue with who he married, an Ethiopian. They were upset. And you know what they said? Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? All of them are fighting words. Some pastors get this. Who made you the spokesperson? (laughs) Sin of Korah. Has he not spoken through us as well, they asked. And then you know the rest of the story, right? God struck Miriam with leprosy. And then when Moses pleaded for her, he said, listen, let her just suffer for seven days outside the camp with her leprosy and see if that slows her tongue down a bit. It did. It did. It had its effect. There probably is no one who knows us better than those from our own families, and by extension, those who knew us as we grew up. It's a fearful thing for me to be a preacher here on the east side of St. Paul. I grew up here. Mary grew up two blocks east of here. Thankfully, nobody's shown up yet. (laughs) I had 19 years of living before I came to Christ, believe me, and I was not a Christian. I was what my mother referred to as a hellion. I don't know what that means, but I don't think it's good. But, you know, those people that grow up with us and they see us day in and day out, those people in our neighborhood, those people in our family especially, they know us. They've seen us stumble badly. They've seen us at our worst moments. And so it was with these people and Jesus except one big difference. None of us teach like Jesus taught. None of us have done miracles and healed people like Jesus had. And none of us is God. That's quite a difference. But these people didn't make that connection, so they're just taking him in the flesh as somebody who they knew. They're familiar with him. And they find it more difficult to give honor and deference to somebody that they know. Familiarity does breed contempt. So Jesus, on his second visit, quotes the same proverb to them that he quoted during his previous visit to Nazareth. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. They did not honor Jesus because of their familiarity with him. They could not or I'd rather say they would not get past the perception of Jesus as just a man and not God. I want to talk to you finally about offended hearts and the cost that they exact. Look at the last couple verses here in verses 57 through 58. And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Have you ever considered the consequences of unbelief and how it may affect the work of God in and through your life and around your life? I'm talking about your unbelief now. These last two verses are filled with implications of unbelief. First, we read that they were scandalized by Jesus' perceived authority. The word behind the translation, offense, you see that in verse uh, 57, they took offense at him. That word offense is the Greek word scandalizo, scandalizo. It's what we get scandal from and scandalized. I think they were embarrassed by him. I think they might have even been ashamed of him. For acting the way he was acting, maybe they thought he was acting beyond his means or as someone more than what he really was because they knew who he was. He was Jesus, Joseph's son, the carpenter. 
They knew that he taught with authority, and they knew about the miracles that they heard about, but they had a sense of being incredulous rather than adoring him as Messiah. They were offended by his ordinary background and the way that he held himself in synagogue. They were offended by his claims. The scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing today. Basically saying, I'm Messiah. They're offended by his common family, just carpenter, and by his lack of formal education and lack of any religious status. He wasn't even a priest. And in their minds, Jesus was just Jesus from the neighborhood. He is just one of them. Therefore, they took offense at him, and this was disastrous for their spiritual well-being. Just stop just for a second and think of the amazing grace that Jesus shed on them by going to them even a second time. Messiah from their hometown. He went and visited them a second time. And for a second time, they rejected him. Unbelief does affect God's work. Jesus had just left Capernaum, and he had been there for over a year through the towns and villages of Galilee, and he was preaching. And he left them with a very stern rebuke about this very problem. We read, Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done, because they did not repent. And he said this, And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend into hell. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would remain to this very day. If the people of Sodom saw all the miracles that I performed in your midst, Sodom would not have been destroyed. They would remain to this very day. It's going to be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Matthew eleven twenty. Wow. That is a rebuke. Why? Because of their unbelief. It was for their unbelief that Jesus began to speak only in parables. Remember, I, I shared that with you when we started Matthew 13, where he started just speaking only in parables because of their unbelief. And he would hide the truth from the multitudes, but expose it and teach it to those that loved him and received him. And as we've already recounted in his first visit to Nazareth, their rejection of him at that time was so intense that we read, and he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And then it says this, and he wondered at their unbelief. He was astounded at their unbelief. Now it's important to note, he could do no miracles by implication because it was a result of their unbelief. Unbelief is the willful rejection of his revelation. Jesus' miracles attested to his deity. He was God in human flesh, and he performed miracles to show them who he was. They attested to his deity, but they willfully rejected all that, even while admitting that he did miracles, even while admitting that he spoke with great authority, they rejected his deity and only received him as a man. Now we know they willfully rejected him by their unbelief because they questioned his deity by referring to what they could grasp of his person and not what was displayed before them. Isn't this the son of Joseph, of Mary? Don't his brothers and sisters just still live around us? Now, I don't want you to mistake what I'm saying for what the false healers in our day and age say, that a person can't be healed if they don't have enough faith. Don't, don't make that connection. That's a wrong connection. Just X that one out. Delete it. Jesus performed many miracles in the midst of multitudes who did not believe. In Capernaum alone, right? He said, how many miracles I did, and they were unbelieving. So it, it's not that he could not actually do 
miracles. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. And God can perform miracles where there's no belief. But here in Nazareth, he chose not to perform them where there was a hard and willful unbelief so that unbelief can become a barrier, listen to me, to divine blessing. Your unbelief can really short-circuit God's blessing to you. Let me give you a story. I'll use myself as an illustration so I don't get in trouble. Early on in our missionary career, we were living in Maluku. It's a, it's a province of 1,000 islands in Indonesia. 1,000 islands, no kidding. People on most of those islands. And so our mission, we had a single-engine uh, Piper Cub that we were using for transportation, and the mission leadership decided, man, there is way too much water for safety. So they suggested that we us poor missionaries, gather our monies together and buy a twin-engine plane. And they told us the cost, and it's like astronomical. I can't even remember what it was. So the leadership came, and we had a meeting uh, in the province that Mary and I were located in with two other families. I think there were only like four or five families at the time. And they're telling us, four or five families, missionaries, okay? We weren't rolling in dough you need to trust God to raise X number of dollars. Let's say $80,000. Could have been $2 million. Doesn't matter. Okay? And because um, and you need a twin-engine airplane. I want to tell you, I'm confessing, okay, vulnerability here. I did not believe that that would take place. I did not pray. I just thought it was ludicrous that they would even expect us to pray like that. It was beyond me, Right? A year later, we had the money, and we had the plane. And guess who was eating humble pie? Now, I didn't tell anybody back at that time. <laughs> but I was so chagrined. I was so embarrassed by my lack of faith. And God just said, I can do anything, Lynette. Do you believe? See, that unbelief robbed me of the blessing. Every time I flew on that plane, I just went, <laughs> please don't, don't make it crash, Lord. You know? <laughs> You know, I mean, but my unbelief, I suffered because of that. The blessing that I could have received in seeing God marvelously provide that kind of money for a plane. God wanted his, his mission to go on in that part of the world. He wanted the gospel to go to those unreached tribes. And he just raised that money within a year. It was like, boom, and it was there. Folks, unbelief can become a barrier to divine blessings as it did with those at Nazareth. Taking that truth from today's text, it's easy to see the people of Nazareth, the way they turned away and missed the manifold blessings by having Messiah in their midst. When we come close to the Lord, like when I heard about that opportunity to pray for that plane, when we're close to the Lord, like when you're listening to me preach and, and the Spirit of God's tapping on you about something, when you come close to the Lord, this is the way you should respond. Seek the Lord while he may be found. He's close to you. Seek him right now. Call upon him because he's near to you. Okay? And let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Confess your sin. Let him return to the Lord and the Lord will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon him. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. That's the way we should respond when we're close to the Lord and the Lord is close to us and he's drawing us and he's tapping us on his shoulder and he wants to communicate with us, we need to just lay down before him. Why? Well, it's very easy. Because the following verses, verses 8 and 9 say, For my thoughts, God, my thoughts aren't your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, because as far as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Because he's God, that's why. Consider the blessings that we forfeited by our own unbelief. When we should come to him, seeking him diligently, calling upon him, confessing our sins, returning to him, forsaking our sins, 
We should come to him with wonder and adoration, prepared to have our world turned upside down, ready to be shocked, awakened, and called to deeper holiness, intentionally looking for anything that would block this blessing from us, and determined to destroy it. That's the way we should be coming to him. I'm totally convinced that if our hearts were like that, every Sunday that we come to church to listen to his word and sing songs to him and pray our prayers to him, that the yielded blessing would be a refreshment to our souls. We would long to come to church next Sunday to have that same experience again with God. One man put it like this. In any church service, the congregation preaches more than half the sermon. I first read that and I went, wait a second. The congregation brings an atmosphere with it. I I agree with that. The atmosphere is either a barrier through which a preacher's word cannot penetrate or else it is such an expectancy that even the poorest sermon becomes a living flame. Each one of you matters. Listen to me. Each one of you matters. How you come to church on Sunday really matters because you carry with you an atmosphere. Many a message has died stone dead, not because there was anything wrong with it, but because the minds of the hearers were so prejudiced against the messenger that it never had a chance. When we meet together to listen to the word of God, we must come with eager expectance and must think not of the man who speaks, that would be me here, but of the spirit who speaks through him. May God be praised. A good friend of mine at Days of Grace Community Church wrote a book entitled Expository Listening. Expository Listening. His name is Ken Ramey. R-A-M-E-Y. Buy it. Expository Listening. It, it's a practical book on the responsibilities of those who listen to expository preaching. At one point towards the end of the book, he summarizes, and I just want to share this with you in closing. These are excellent points. Come with anticipation. If only those people at Nazareth would have anticipated Jesus coming back to visit them as Messiah. Anticipation is the listener's responsibility before the word is preached on Sunday. Get your head and your heart and the heart of your family ready for worship on Saturday night. What do you do on Saturday night? You might want to take time to pray. You might want to sing together. You might want to read from the Word together to prepare yourself for worship the next day. Oh, this is talking radical, huh? I know it is. But do you want to really receive the blessings that God has for you on a Sunday morning? Try this. Believe me. Ask God to make your heart ready to receive whatever he has for you through the preaching of the word and expect God to speak to you through the sermon. Secondly, attention. This is the listener's responsibility while the word is being preached. When I'm preaching, you should be attentive. It helps to take notes. Sit and quiet yourself and your family shortly before the service begins. We're trying to cultivate that. It's turning a big ship. We have a prelude, right? That's when the piano is playing, before the service. When the lights kind of go out in the back, that means come on into the service and quiet yourself a bit. Just get your heart ready, prepared to receive God's word. That's attentiveness. Pray one more time for the Lord to speak to you today through the word. Sing joyfully and with exuberance. Follow the outline, if there is one. And look up the scriptures as you are able. I know I I shoot a lot of scripture to you. A lot of times you just have to take down the address. Look it up later. Nod your head when something strikes you. And smile if I make eye contact with you. Don't just do this to me. If Mary gets out her fingernail file and starts filing, I'm done, man. It's like, okay, let's pray. You do have an effect. You do have an effect on me, believe me. 
That's why preaching in a black church is marvelous. Preach it, pastor. Preach it. Amen. Oh, praise be Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm not talking a charismatic church. I'm just talking a black church. They're responsive. You know, we're the frozen chosen, all the Nordic people up here. I've been too many places, okay? And it's okay. I, I love you. I love every one of you, but a little feedback's nice. I, we, had a, we had a visitor come through. His name was Pastor James. Sat in the back of the church, and every once in a while, I'd just go, Amen! Amen! I just thought, oh, oh, that's great. Just keep that up. You can't fake it, right? Don't, don't do it just to do it. Fight off distractions. If you're distracted by all the movement and stuff, sit up front. There's less movement up here. It's just the change over here. But, you know, if people coming and going distract you, then sit closer to the front. Fight against the distractions, okay? So anticipation, attention. Thirdly, application. Now, this is the listener's responsibility after the sermon has been preached. If appropriate, let the preacher know how the sermon impacted you and why. Not for, the ser- not for me, but for your sake. It's always good to tell somebody else what happened. It doesn't have to be me. Discuss the sermon and its impact with your family or with friends, maybe even over lunch together with them. Identify where your life needs to change as a result of what you heard and determine what you will do to make that change happen. That's how you're transformed by the Word of God. Fourthly, and this is my own, I added this, appreciation. Appreciation. I'm going to write to Kenny and tell him, man, you missed it. This is the listener's responsibility going forward. So you've got the ris- listener's responsibility before the word is preached, anticipation. While it's being preached, attention. And after it's preached, application. But then going forward, appreciation. Thankfulness is our spiritual duty when God blesses us. And when we need to spread it all around, express your joy to others. When you follow such a path, you will not prevent God from blessing you and others around you. I I can't stress that enough. You bring an aura with you. You bring an atmosphere with you. If you're all out of sorts spiritually, get it right, will you? It affects the people around you. You'll be refreshed you'll be revitalized by his word. And isn't that what we come? We come to eat, come to partake. And so what a great segue into sharing the Lord's table today. So with that, um, just let me close in a word of prayer and the men can come forward for the communion. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Father, we pray that you would just um, continue to teach us how to receive your word. Father, thank you for um, the fact that you have given us your word Help us to learn how to receive it in a way that doesn't hinder your blessings that you want to pour out upon us. And Lord, uh, let our hearts be rejoicing even today as we've heard your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit and the application of his word to our lives. In Jesus' name.